Hey everyone, <laughs> welcome to Books and Brew. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. It's Friday. It's the blustery winds outside. <laughs> it is. Where we're, where we're at right now, LA is getting some winds right now. We got that, what is it, Santa Ana winds? Yeah, we're near mountains and shit, so everything is either colder or hotter where we are. We're not central LA, but yeah. I literally had to catch a plant when I went and got the mail because it was already falling off. Okay. Like when people, when I make the joke with people, I gotta go catch a plant. It's like, haha, you're funny. I'm like, no, I gotta go catch. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened more than once. Oliver, what's going on, buddy? Oh my God, we have Oliver right now in chat. How's it going? How's it going? Uh, so Shady's in chat as well. Good to see you guys. Oh man, a lot of things are happening uh, right now. It is uh, pretty exciting to be honest, uh, not only from my own work stance and what's happening there. Uh, by the way, uh, a little secret, we're getting chibis. Oh, I thought you had chibis. Plushies. Plushies. Oh, I want a plushie. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I want a plushie too. I still want a, what is it? From Discord? What is it? That thing. They have a, a wampus. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like you have a Discord a, wampus. It has a weird name. Uh, I'm oh, I'm already on that list, Shady. Uh, for those who are listening to the audio track of this, uh, yes, uh, I've mentioned this a few other times. I work for Gigabyte uh, Oris, and uh, they are getting some new swag, which is exciting because I get to oversee some of that production. I um, I honestly <laughs> would love a Gina Lee plushie. Oh yeah, that would be absolutely adorable. I would love that. I don't even know how to go about, like we have an idea for shirts and bags and maybe <laughs> pins. I don't know who, what the fuck to do about a plushie. I would, I would be, I would, would love that. And uh, a Moscow plushie. Oh, by the way, I have to get to your cousin to make sure that, uh, I gotta fix something up so she can make some Mo a Moscow chibi for us. That'd be amazing. Well, maybe after her sister's wedding. True, right, true. Right now it's a little nuts. <laughs> Guys, a new book just came out. Um, You're welcome. Happy a new book, <laughs> and you know what this means, right? Uh, this means that, and I'm not sure. I've got to double well, check here. Well, you've got to know who made the book. Who made the book? Critical Role. Yes. <laughs> I do not believe that the Taldore Reborn book is considered. I I don't know if it's like fully licensed by uh by Wizards of the Coast. I feel like Matt takes the time to actually make a lot of his stuff in their books, but I don't know. It's brand I, new. But I don't it, know if it's considered canon. Bought it for Mike as a pre-anniversary present. It is considered open game license, uh, property of Wizards of the Coast LLC. So it could be. Maybe this is a, this is official now. I'm always confused about Teldor because I know that while uh, Critical Role is very close with D and D Beyond as well as uh, Wizards of the Coast. Um, not everything they make is considered canon. Like the gunslinger is technically not official, uh, but it is a subclass of the fighter. Uh, the uh, the what's the one that uh, that Chutney turned out to be? Um, oh, the lycanthrope blood no, hunter. Well, the blood hunter is its own beast that is not considered uh, an official class, but it is recognized by D and D Beyond, who is very in tied with Wizards of the Coast. So. It's very strange whenever it comes to Critical Role and the content they provide because it's so well ingrained in their own world that it kind of doesn't really fit the bill and I don't believe Wizards counts it. So it's strange. I feel like they count it. I don't know. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's the case. Regardless, if it is, if it isn't, regardless, we have some new things here. Um, That's a we big have book. It's a big, hefty book. Let me go ahead and just get the last page here and just say how much it is. It is about 280 pages. Uh, and to uh, the people who were putting together the physical book itself, not writing and doing art, uh, I love you. <laughs> Why do I love you? Because you you got a, 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 a book, a, a, <laughs> a was bookmarker. <laughs> But it's already built in. You have I, to hide them from the cats, though. Oh my god! I was like, oh, it's a bookmarker. I needed that. Uh, there's a few interesting things when it comes to the Taldori Reborn book. I um, haven't gotten a chance to read it. I literally ran out the door and went, "Oh, it's delivered. Here's your anniversary present. If it's the right thing, you'll know if it's for you." Bye. <laughs> I didn't get to look at it at all. 
I do not believe that Goliaths are a thing in Tal'Dorei. Uh, the reason being is that they label them as half-giants. Oh, that's weird. So that's the first thing that sort of caught my eye. Um, they go through a lot of the races here mm -hmm. uh, within Tal'Dorei. The one thing I don't note, I don't see here, is uh, Genasi's. I'm sure they're included, but maybe just not in this book. Yeah, I can I can assume that Genasi's are a thing within the world. Of, obviously, we've seen it uh, in, in Critical Role, but it doesn't seem like they have a particular stat block. It seems like that's still not really a thing. But the biggest thing that they have here, at least that for me, uh, not only if, if you're a big fan of Critical Role, it has a lot of details on the uh, place, the PC characters and sort of what happened beyond them uh, after the story. But it comes with some brand new subclasses. Yeah, that's what I liked. Um, <laughs> that I was looking forward to. One of them is familiar. Could you guess which one? I know there's a druid one that I want that I want to read, but I don't know. The Path of the Juggernaut Barbarian. Oh, it's finally Roly. in a book. Roly, <laughs> absolutely right. The Path of the Juggernaut Barbarian um, are strong, hefty fellows uh, or fellas um, who in might of spirit uh, are immo immovable objects and unstoppable forces all combined into one. Uh, Juggernaut Barbarians can be found all over Tal'Dorei uh, and they're common along a Goliath's... Uh, oh, well, there's Goliath right there. Goliath Warriors. Um, some dwarven and humanoid survivalists uh, within the Cliff Keep Mountains. So obviously Matt has put a lot of detail in this, what he considers where they would be. Um, it's him. I don't feel like there's any lack of detail in that book. I am... I don't know how that man sleeps. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's it, it boggles the mind. Uh, few things that we know about Roly already through the Path of Juggernaut. He has a thing called Thunderous Blows. Uh, starting at third level, uh, when you are within your rage, uh, and when you hit a creature, they have to make a strength saving throw, uh, or you can shove them five feet and take their space immediately. So you can move five feet forward by punching them or hitting them and pushing them back. Um, obviously, uh, Roly has a bit of an upgrade version of that where he gets a push at 10 feet. Um, but yeah, that's uh, what he has currently. Actually, he says here when you start at 10th level, you get to push a creature 10 feet. So he can technically unattune from that rap he has. <laughs> I still get the, the benefit, which is nice. Uh, I feel like the Juggernaut Barbarian was very much made to be the, uh, the person in the massive war. <laughs> People running across the room, you know, attacking all around. You have an all out war and you're the one guy going punch back, attack, attack, going through the uh, ballistics, hit them. Uh, kind of like a like a war machine, it feels like. Uh, really kind of acts a little bit. It kind of is like Juggernaut from um, X-Men. X-Men, yeah. Yeah, because I know he has that big ass helmet. Like if you don't know who Juggernaut is, just like you'll know by that helmet. Yeah. But like, I mean, he was like a big dude too. Question. He was like massive. Is Juggernaut a mutant? I don't know. I feel like he's not supposed to be. He's not? The reason like he's why he's huge. like that is because there's a magical gem in his forehead. Yeah, because uh, I always said that he wasn't considered one, but like he was with that group because it wasn't like normal. Shady saying yes. Wrong! He is I actually not liked X-Men a lot when I was a kid. I like came home and watched that shit. I, I liked Spider-Man more than X-Men. I didn't do comics, okay? I mainly watched TV shows. Mm -hmm. so it was like Spider-Man, Batman, X-Men were like the main ones. And Superman. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, uh, you also get uh, at third level Spirit of the Mountain. Uh, when you are raging, uh, you cannot be knocked prone uh, or moved among the ground against your will. That's pretty uh, good. That's happened a few times. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yes, he has an innate uh, mutant power. Once he stops, he can't stop. No, I think he's not I'm a mutant. Look it up. <laughs> I don't believe he's a mutant. 
It says, why is Juggernaut not? Although not a mutant, Juggernaut has been featured as a prominent member of the Brotherhood of Mutants. There it is. It says, although not a mutant, buddy. Oh, he doesn't have the gene. No, he doesn't have and the mutant says, gene. Instead, his power comes from a mystical gem he stumbled upon in the Forgotten Temple in Korea. Despite, uh, it says here, despite his power, Juggernaut is not actually a mutant. I don't know what go are you on Bing? Where, where are you on Shady? Right, I I definitely Googled him on Bing, maybe. Um, Not on Wikipedia. Yeah. It even says it on Wikipedia. Actually, it says he's been featured in the pro as a prominent member of the Brotherhood of Mutants, but he's not not a mutant. Well, let's continue on. Speaking of Juggernauts, let's continue on with Juggernauts. Uh, at 6th level, you get an ability called Demolishing Might. Uh, whenever you do your melee weapon attacks and uh, against uh, objects or structures, you can deal an extra 1d6 to constructs and deal double damage to objects and, and structures. I kind of mixed that sentence up a little bit, sorry about that. But essentially, <laughs> you can tear down a building. Um, <laughs> still, kind of on brand with a Juggernaut. I feel like Matt was watching X-Men one day and was like, That'd be that's a barbarian, right? That's well, I a mean, barbarian. I feel like that's what you could relate it to. He was watching X Men Two, <laughs> where Juggernaut is chasing Kitty Pride, and he's he's just smashing through walls. Yeah, it's basically the Hulk, Oliver. Yeah, it's definitely is a is a Hulk. Um, also, at sixth level, in addition to demolishing might, you get a uh, uh, resolve st a stance. Uh, you can temporarily reinforce your combat ability to make yourself uh, more of a defense. At the start of your turn, no action required. You can assume a defensive stance that lasts until the start of your next turn. While in the stance, you can't be grappled uh, and attack rolls on you have disadvantage and your weapon attacks uh, and your weapon attacks are made with advantage. I don't know if Roly knows that or if that's still in the like Unearth Arcana version. Might I'll have not, to talk to him. May not be in that one. No. I'll have to talk to him. Short rest is gonna be fun when I actually bring that up. And be like, what? I get I, I get advantage on all my attacks? It's like, yeah. You didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Steve. Oh no. Well, I mean like me and him went like opposite because we went we both went on Earth Arcana. It's true. We both didn't pick like a like a, uh, an a published class. Yeah. yeah. Uh at 10th level, and he's used this a few times, he gets Hurricane Strike. Uh, whenever you make an attack roll against uh, an enemy, you can make an additional attack roll within five feet of, an, of another enemy. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, wait, no, no, hold on, hold on. They definitely changed a bunch of things here. This is different. Yeah, question is, does he want to go with that version or the Unearth Arcana? That's a good question. That's a good question. Because, like, he... <clears throat> it's based off of Unearth Arcana. Uh, it says here, 10th level, your blows can hurl foes through the air and into the attacks of your allies. As a reaction, you can push a creature at least 5 feet. Uh, when you push a creature at least 5 feet, so that's when you hit them and you can push them due to your, uh, your first ability, which was uh, Thunder's Blows. So when you push someone as a 5 feet, you can use your reaction uh, can leap into an unoccupied space next to the creature, and doing so, the creature must succeed a strength save. Um, let's see here. Wait a minute. Hurricane Strike sounds a lot like... Uh, I'm going to read it verbatim. As a reaction, when you push a creature at least five feet, you can leap into an unoccupied space next to that creature. Uh, to, if you do so, the creature must succeed on a strength save uh, or be knocked prone. Oh! It's like his shove ability. It's a, it's so what it sounds like here is that it sounds like the thunderous blows gets a bit of an upgrade. Mm. So it sounds like you get hit, strength save to get pushed. Yeah. You succeed, you don't get pushed. Nothing happens. Let's say you fail. You get pushed five feet, Roly runs up to you. As a reaction, because he's pushed you, he can then spend you can he then has to force you to make another strength saving throw. And if you fail that one, you are knocked prone. That's dangerous for a bar. Now you have a barbarian doing advantage strikes on you while you're on the floor. Wizards beware. No strength save is gonna save you from this guy. 
Holy shit. Yeah, they were high enough for the first one. So it's interesting, I know that, um... It's almost like you hope to be shoved so you don't get hit. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, upon getting hit, you get shoved. Mm. So it almost is like, please don't hit, please don't hit, please don't... Okay, I failed the first strength. Save. Excuse me. Please don't make me fail that second one. Shit. <laughs> Um, yeah, the biggest difference here is that uh, the Unearth Arcana version that Rolly has, I know at 10th level he has a thing where if he attacks you, he can use a bonus action to make another attack against a person next to him. Mm. It's almost like doing a wide berth swing. Uh, yeah, I have to talk to Steve to see if he wants to keep his, his type or this type. It's interesting. And at, 10th, at the 14th level, excuse me, you get a thing at uh, an ability called Unstoppable. Uh, your fury in battle makes you unstoppable. When you are raging, your speed cannot be reduced. You are immune to frightened, paralyzed, prone, and the stun condition. Uh, if you are paralyzed, prone, or stunned, uh, you can use a bonus action to enter a rage, even if you couldn't take it actions otherwise. Uh, and then those conditions are then nullified for that amount of time that you are raging. He needs that because he's been blinded, stunned, and like paralyzed a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, so he, he might be able to have that very useful skill. Could you find a really good use of this barbarian subclass? Fighting a monk. Anyway, but... Oh, yeah. Yeah, because then they can't stun and strike you, or if they do, like, you could just rage. This is an anti-monk barbarian. Yeah. That's true. Well, Stunning Strike requires a constitution saving throw, and usually a, a Barbarian will, will succeed. It. So yeah, they'll make it. Well, I'm just saying, but, like, but I mean, he's been blinded and paralyzed more than once, and he hasn't been able to move. Wow. In like two separate fights, and sometimes in the same fights, so. That's amazing. You're This is an anti-monk Barbarian. Monk or like... If somebody's really quick, like I would say rogue, but rogues rogues don't generally stun unless like they have like I don't know a magic item or like poison or something. Uh, yeah, something like a spell, like the trickster rogue or something that would like make them go paralyzed or make them blind or something that they would have to have an added something to do it. I would consider this barbarian sort of a one man army, uh, and. Because you know most of the time they're- I mean, not to say that some people don't make barbarians wise, but the norm is they normally don't. So like Either if they they're were low to, in intelligence or low in wisdom. Yeah, like so if they fail at save, then that that thing happens, they could just rage. Because- yeah, 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 because uh... Usually wisdom saving throws are good for- uh, to fight against like whole person. That's a big one uh, that can stop a barbarian in his tracks. Yeah. Um, which I've used on it. <laughs> Common motion, which I think is another wisdom save, which can end a, which can end a rage. So the fact that this can you you could fail a saving throw. Well, for those conditions. And then be paralyzed or stunned, rage out, and then continue to move. It's kind of scary. It's like no, nothing's stopping this guy. I'm gonna definitely have to talk to. To Steve about this. Uh, Shady's like, uh, poisons and such for rogues, they should be using poisons, uh, or at least they should. Yeah. Like Definitely poison helps. dagger or something, but yeah. 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 Uh, Bard! It, it doesn't say you're immune to poison though, right? No. Yeah, no, you... it says you're immune to fear if you rage. Correct. So you're still taking the poison damage, you can still get the poison condition, meaning that you have a disadvantage in all your attack rolls. Uh, but you can just do reckless attack and just cancel that cancel that and just roll straight mm. uh, so there's always a way there's a way around it for this barbarian to do you know bard <laughs> bard's interesting you go to the college of tragedy oh yeah matt had mentioned that one on the stream he was like college of tragedy bard and then like the blight druid or something mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Those are the two that I thought were probably interesting. We'll get to that. Uh, so the College of... The funny thing is when I think of College of Tragedy, um, I think of... Uh, like the emo board? No, no, no. Uh, tr what's the... Comedy and Tragedy? 
Oh, like the symbols, the faces? Yeah, I'm thinking of like like a theater play. You know, where there is comedy, there is tragedy, and where there's a tragedy, there's comedy. Actually, uh, for those who are wondering, that is the main thing of comedy. There <laughs> always is someone getting hurt, and there always is a level of kind of tragedy to it, you know? Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, like silly faces, mm -hmm. like even to a kid, like, oh, you're doing a silly face, it's funny. Originally, the reason why that's funny is because you're kind of making fun of someone because they look different. You're like, oh, they got a face like this. You know, if you saw someone walking down the street and they had a weird face, you laugh. There's some tragedy to it because you're making fun of someone. Yeah. However, that's how you learn. They that's... also say, like, I mean, I hate to say it, but they're like, the funniest people are like the most sad. Yeah, that's true too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they're, that they say that like, there is like, there's like depression in a lot of comedians uh, is because there is some tragedy there. However, that's how you not uh, insult someone's intelligence is by someone making fun of you and going, I see that, I recognize it, I laugh with you, I can prove myself, or I can just laugh and it's fun. Uh, so there's always a little bit of underlying to that. Um, so, tragedy. Not many grand, not all grand stories conclude in a triumphant victory. Many tales end with death and despair, and the bards of the College of Tragedy know this sorrow and uh, pathos are emotional. Uh, they are emotional and uh, and as a potent of joy, uh, just as potent as joy and delight. So, it's almost like those people who tell you stories to warn you about things. It's like, oh, this Greek tale, even though everyone dies, tells us a story that always, you know, I don't know. Uh, make sure that your campfire is lit taken out before you leave because then a <laughs> fire will happen and all the little families will die i don't know yo ghost what's well, good evening buddy right now we're talking about the college of tragedy bard brand new subclass found uh within the taldore reborn book by the way i'm super happy that i can just move the book marker anywhere i want and i'll <laughs> never lose my place I don't know who did it. But the fact that you added a bookmarker, I love you. It's so useful. Probably need more than one. Yeah, but I feel maybe. like most of Critical Role stuff has that, like a little added, just a little added thing. My journal has two. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has more than one, or maybe I'm thinking of another one. But yeah, this one has one, and it's what I normally use. Oh, this one has. So again, it's super windy. It has two. <laughs> uh, Go says, uh, honestly, I haven't played D&D &D in a few months. So rip. Uh, I don't know when hey we're man, not we're playing D&D. &D, so. We do D&D &D content every week, multiple times, a, multiple times a week. And some of it's not even streamed. True. Uh, so the first thing you get uh, for College of Tragedy at third level is that uh, Poetry of min uh, Misery. That felt, sounds fun, doesn't it? Sounds sad. Uh, whenever you or an ally within 30 feet of you rolls a 1 on the d20 for an attack roll, ability score, or saving throw, you can use a reaction uh, and regain one use of your bardic inspiration. So it's like, that's a sad story. I'm going to tell it. And then you could, you can make another use of your bardic in inspiration. That's actually kind of like depressing. <laughs> you failed. I get a point. That's hilarious. Um, I need to go find the motivation to go socialize again. Don't worry, Ghost. We all know that feeling. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, that's so sad. That is just a... That is such a sad ability. <laughs> Benefit on your, on, your, on your partner's failures. Uh, sorrowful Fate. Another thing you get at level 3. You get to exploit a foe's peril and instill a deeping fear of sorrow and doom when you or an ally you can see uh, forces a creature to make a saving throw. So whenever a wizard makes someone makes a saving throw, uh, you can expend one use of your bardic inspiration to change the type of saving throw to a charisma saving throw instead. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, because a lot of people aren't very charismatic. Whenever you or an ally, so it can affect you as well. Interesting. If the target fails the saving throw, roll a bardic inspiration die. The target takes psychic damage equal to that result. Hmm. 
Interesting. Mm -mm. So, let's say, okay, that's pretty good. So let's say your bard is casting a spell on, ooh, let's say a ghost. I don't feel they're that Are ghosts charismatic. Are to, to psychic? Because they're like an average. No, no, no. Oh. But that's a good question. But um, they're not. Um, like we are a good example is that we were fighting some sort of like UNT demon creature, uh, who I can only imagine was not the most charismatic person. But they were very wise and very constitution heavy. This... I don't know. I mean, like, the only reason I question that is because he was also part demon, and I feel like you, as a demon, you'd have to talk people into shit, so I don't know. Okay, we'll use the Tao, then, as yeah. a good example. The Tao was less charismatic than it was wise and constitution-heavy. So it could have been one of those things where it's like, oh, you're gonna roll? Stop, 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 stop. I'm making it a charisma save. Oh, shoot. Now I that mean, everything's that's, changed. That's what banishment is. Technically, it worked, but you know. Well, essentially, it's good for those creatures that you know are very low in charisma. Like, if you're fighting like an elephant that has high constitution. I feel like if you're fighting like an ogre or something. Then yes! You're, like, you're probably yes. not going to think they're the most charismatic fucking person. Change it to charisma. That's good. That's good. Um, you can't use abil this ability until you take a long rest. Uh, at sixth level. You get a thing called Tale of Hubris. <laughs> you learn to weave a magical narrative that draws out the fatal arrogance of your foes. When a creature scores a critical hit against you or an ally within 60 feet of you, and that you can see, you can use your reaction and expend one bardic inspiration die to target the attacking creature and evoke the story of their downfall. For a minute, or until the creature suffers a critical hit, any weapon attacks against the target scores a critical hit on a roll of 18 to 20. That's great. At, at 14th level, it's 17 to 20. Oh, so it lowers each time you level up or what? Just twice. Oh, okay. So at 6th six, at six level, it's 18 to 20. At uh, 14th level, it's 17 to 20. So essentially, you have to... The moment someone goes... Uh, the DM critical hits, you know, one of your friends. You're like, <gasps> okay, I use the ability. Now you're getting critical hits every time. <laughs> you're kind of hoping for the downfall of your friends. Not really. I feel like you're just prepping for it. And sometimes you get like a ton of criticals back to back and then you get like a shit ton of ones so nobody ever knows of you. God damn it, ghost. I read chat right now. What? He goes, because we were talking about ogres, and he goes, you know, you never knew ogres had layers. <laughs> God damn it. I've been wanting to watch that movie for a while. Really? I have. I thought you can't stand donkeys. I can't stand Shrek as a whole. <laughs> but recently, I was like, you know, I kind of want to watch it again. It's kind of how I felt when I was like... I feel like it's because they made so many. It's like, all right, already. <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of want to watch the first one. I think because, like, as a little kid, you don't expect the stereotypical princess to turn into an ogre or burp or, like, be a human because I love Disney, don't get me wrong, but, like, they make people <laughs> seem like an unattainable image of as a princess. <laughs> Let's see. In addition to that, Tales of Hubris, at sixth level, you get a thing called Impending Misfortune. Uh, your words can twist the power of fate to create a trumpet uh, from the, prom uh, the promise of future despair. Jesus Christ. When you make an attack roll or saving throw, you can gain a plus 10 to that roll, but the next attack or saving throw you make mm -hmm. must have a negative 10 penalty. Jeez. Uh, if not used, this penalty will only disappear when you finish a short or long rest. So you need to, you can either take that penalty or the next roll you make or not will be normal, but until then, everything after that is a negative 10. That's, that's game changing. That's like, I have to succeed on this. The next <laughs> attack I roll, I'm gonna be useless. Interesting. 
That's interesting. This bard subclass is getting a lot of things. It sounds like this bard is just depressed. It kind of does. That's what I said. The emo bard. It's the emo bard. Right. I mean, like, the bard is known as, like, the fuckboy, so I mean... There has to be an at opposite. At least there gives... <laughs> I mean, not to say, again, you don't have to play your character or class or race any certain way you do you, but I'm just saying, that's that's the joke, that, you know, the bard is the fuckboy and fucks everything, or girl, and so, you know, maybe they were just trying to change it up a little. This is the bard who goes to high school, wears all black, uh, has a choker, um, grabs his black leather-bound book, uh, with his, except for the leather band book. with his skull <laughs> pencil, uh, hangs out underneath the bleachers and writes bad poetry. Yeah, but like half the girls like that guy because he's not a jock and not an ass. <laughs> There's a few that <laughs> like that guy. <laughs> the last ability you get as this bard, this bard has been taking up the entire stream. It's crazy. Uh, is 14th level the Nimbus of uh, Pantheos? Uh, upon reaching this 14th level, you can touch a willing creature as an action and empower them with the tragic heroism. I mean, I have the spell heroism. Why would you heroism be tragic? I don't know. For one minute, the creature is surrounded by a mournful music uh, and ghostly singing, granting the be uh, following benefits and drawbacks. Oh, it's like Phantom of the Opera. It's like, I'm trying to give you motivation, but it's this. Oh, stop. <laughs> I hate this class now. The creature has a plus four bonus to their AC. But? The creature has an advantage on attack rolls and saving throws. But? When the creature, creature hits a target with a weapon attack, the target takes an extra 1d10 radiant damage. But? What's the drawback? Uh... Let's see, uh, the drawback. Any weapon uh, attacks against this creature score a, oh, any weapon attacks uh, against the creature scores a critical on a 18 to 20. Mm -mm. So you're gonna get hit. Uh, Go real high. M25, prefer the bard from the gamers, uh, all 50 of them now. He's definitely a fuck boy. <laughs> I've never got to see the gamers, which is interesting. I gotta go see that. Brain Tech, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> Don't you be sharing that Steve Pog emote in my chat. How dare you? Mm. That Thermal Take love. I'm kidding, we love Thermal Take. I've got the uh, all-in-one cooler in my system right now. Oh boy, you ready to get it religious? Oh, you gonna go over a cleric? Yeah, we are. I'm going with a damn druid. You wanna go druid first? Yeah, I well, we're going to know with the blight druid. Okay, all right. we can go to druid. I'll say this much: there are two cleric subclasses here, the blood domain and the moon domain. Ooh, we'll get into that later. We'll we'll do druid first. Both those seem interesting. Right? Yeah, it does. So, the druid get the circle of the blighted. Sounds pretty metal already. Uh, for those who channel the magic of life and nature, often find themselves drawn to a particular shrine or natural site. Kind of stick in a particular space. Um, binding their body and spirit to these places of power. Such druids draw vitality from their chosen location, protecting it with their lives. But not all succeed in protecting their sacred realms. Whether the subtle corruption of it's it's either vile magic, or tainted due to ancient uh, uh, terror, or a terrible mistake unleashed by the druid themselves, a land can be cursed with magic and warps the druid's bond with the land, thus making them a bit kind of well blighted. Added that last part of my own. Um, okay, so. The Blighted Druid. I'm expecting some fun things here. Defied Ground. Defiled Ground, excuse me. Is second we level. Defied Ground. Uh, when you choose this circle at level two, you can use a bonus action to corrupt a patch of land of the area, or area, or area of water, in a 10 foot radius centered on a point within 60 feet of you. So you pick 60 feet, that 
pull out a land, 10 feet, becomes corrupted. No, the corruption, huh? That's a bun. <laughs> the corruption lasts for a minute. Uh, it is difficult to rain. Uh, that for any creature that are just hot hostile to you, so you can choose. Uh, additionally, when a creature uh, is in the area, it takes damage uh, from an attack or spell from the first time it. Oh, hold on, excuse me. Let me reread this. Uh, additionally, when a creature is in the area and takes damage. So there we go. Uh, from an attack or, or spell for the first time that they are in that area. And it takes an additional 1d4 necrotic damage. You can move this patch of corrupt corruption up to 30 feet as a bonus action. At 10th level, uh, the defiled ground becomes 20 feet and you can roll a d6 for damage. Uh, and at 10th level, uh, it goes, let's see here, uh, that was at 10th level and at 14th level, you can use a d8. Uh, does it cost, cast a, a... No, it doesn't cost a reaction. Hmm. So anyone in that, or any hostile creature in there takes an extra damage regardless. No. It just happens. Imagine the fighter running in, doing three attacks around and getting extra d8s every single hit. That is massive. Absolutely massive. Also, at second level, you get a thing called blighted shape. Mm, uh, like wild shape. Yeah, it's 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 an alternative for your wild shape. Uh, the, your physical form slowly uh, begins to show effects of your corruption uh, that you wield. <laughs> you sit the cat. Uh, you you get blackened veins that trace along your skin. Uh, protruding, gnarling, bony protrusions and eerie uh, fer uh, pheromones. Uh, you gain proficiency in the intimidation skill while you're in this form. Additionally, when you're transformed by your wild shape feature, you get a plus two or two AC. Oh, that's nice. Uh, as gnarled spikes protrude from your body uh, and you're in, your beast form also gains dark vision. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can still turn into animals. Oh, this is just like added to it? This is just added. That's cool. Yeah, because sometimes the AC you choose is not that great for like the animal. That's so goddamn cool. <laughs> you can turn into a wolf and be like a protrusion bony spike monster wolf. That's why your AC probably goes up. Oh, that is awesome. Yes, buddy. There are so <laughs> many good things you can do there. Oh, that's so sick. Oh, that's so sick! And it just happens. It just happens, and you get and you get dark uh, dark vision. So if you are, I mean, normally when you're a druid, you have dark vision. But when you take the form of your your animal, you get that senses. Yeah. So when if you're taking the form of, I don't know, a, most a bird, things have dark vision. Not everything. Like we're no, not trying to do rats and, saying, and like, spiders. Most things do. Most things, but this guarantees that you have dark vision. That's pretty awesome. I like that. Yes. Uh, at six level, you get a thing called Call of the Shadow Seeds. The hell does that mean? Uh, you can summon the feral children of the forest from the life force of your enemies. What? The hell does that mean? When a creature that is, I guess so. When a creature that is not undead or construct takes damage within your defiled ground area, you can use a reaction to summon a blighted sapling in an unoccupied space within five feet of that creature. The sapling acts on your initiative, obeying your verbal commands. The blight sapling remains in your service until it is reduced by zero hit points uh, until the end of your turn. Uh, until uh, end of your uh, next long rest, re long rest, or you summon another sapling. Uh, how many times can you do this? Let's see here. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. Uh, they do have these sapling stats. Uh, the hit points are very low. It is only twice your druid level. So if you're a level six druid when you get this, it only has 12 HP. 
its armor class is very low. It's 10 plus your proficiency bonus. So I think at this point it'd be 13. Um, let's see here. It is, it could use your spell attack modifier to hit. Mm, so that's that's good. pretty good. Yeah, Brain Tech, we have our cat walking around. He <laughs> thinks he owns the place. We have three, but only two are uh, camera whores. So that's interesting. So I'm going to paint the scenario how this works. You create the defiled ground bonus mm -hmm. action, right? Yeah. Um, doesn't take a reaction to do the additional damage that already comes from your defiled, defiled ground. Now here comes either the wizard, the sorcerer, anyone who does an attack on this creature that's in the defiled ground. You could then use your reaction to then summon, like almost like imagine like blood coming out of the creature, lands on the defiled ground and a small little sapling pops out and just starts attacking at the end of your turn. Like a, oh, what are they called? In Harry Potter when it's like the screaming drakes or something, the mandrakes? Yeah. So it's kind of like that. And they do 2d4 plus your proficiency bonus damage. That's not bad. You're just adding on to it. It's just added added damage. This is definitely an area control uh, subclass. Yeah. Uh, lastly, at tenth level, you get a full a uh, full uh, conjuration. Foul. <sighs> Can't read. Foul conjuration. Fool. There's no double O's in there. Uh, Starting at 10th level, the creatures you conjure are malformed, uh, bloated with toxins. Ew. Any beast, fey, or plant, including your blighted saplings, summoned by you. What are you doing? You're off camera. I'm moving over because there's a cat in the way. <laughs> You're way off camera. Uh, so anything that this you summon gains the following traits. So not only are you summoning little sapling friends, uh, you're also getting kind of bonuses to anything that you can conjure up. Blighted resistance. The creature has immunity to narco uh, nar uh, narcotic. Necrotic. Necrotic. Narcotic as drugs. Yeah, they're immune to drugs, bro. Uh, necrotic. <laughs> Jeez. It's, you could tell it's the end of the week. Yeah, that's why I said once I yawn, that's it. It happens. And poison damage, you're immune to it. And immune to the poison condition. Uh, that's not bad. Toxic demise. When a creature is reduced to zero hit points, uh, it explodes in a burst of toxic mulch. Mm. Each creature within five feet of the exploding creature must make a con save. Uh, or, let's see here, uh, or something happens, there's a table down here. Or you can use an action to cause that summoned creature to explode, immediately killing it and causing this effect. <laughs> so you can summon eight wolves, I think you can do so, at a certain point. Not dire wolves, but like regular wolves. Bloated, fat, pus-covered wolves that are sickly and gangly, jaws hanging out. Like they just came from the dead and just infected. Run, all run, you can command them, all rush this one person and you go, action, all of them, I think you maybe do one, let me double check. You can cause a summon, so you can do one at a time. But you can go, snap a finger, pop, something happens. So. Ew. <laughs> Ooh, it's pretty good. If the summoned creature is a challenge rating one fourth or lower, you do 1d4 necrotic damage. That's pretty good initially if like it just went to zero hit points. Yeah. You know. If it's one half or lower, 1d6. If it's challenge rating one or lower, or higher, excuse me, one or higher, the number of d8s of necrotic damage equal to the creature's challenge rating. So 1d8. So 1d8, if it's challenge rating two, 2d8. Uh, if there is no challenge rating, that's interesting. So like a plant? Well, I think there is challenge rating zero. I don't know what the hell that would be. I'm unsure. Of, I'm unsure of a creature you can summon that has no challenge rating. There must be one, right? 
That's a probably be one. Hmm. Like a bug. <laughs> oh, they would have a challenge rating. Hmm. I don't know off the top of my head, unfortunately. Well, if you happen to be that lucky person and found and broke the code <laughs> to find no challenge rating, the number of D6s of necrotic damage equal to your proficiency bonus. That's just for it dying. Not bad. Let's see here. I feel like we're, we can do maybe one more. How do you, what do you feel about doing just one more? Well, there is things with a challenge rating zero. Challenge rating zero, I think, doesn't a mean it has. A Nid, an El Mirage, a, I... a Lemur, and a Mimic. I was gonna say, I don't think challenge rating zero means no challenge rating. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just means they're easy to kill. Uh, I'm gonna give you an option. The fuck's Ever? a premium rant? Okay. <laughs> uh, you could choose the next. Subclass we're in the last subclass we're gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, the blood magic wizard, the rune child sorcerer, the oath of the open sea paladin. Uh, so Ford, and then the rune ch child sorcerer was like, oh, what's his face, Gilmore? Was he? Yeah, because remember they took the runes to him and at Bria's one shot, and he could. He could do magic and he could read the runes. And he was, I think she did call him a rune child. I think they, her and Matt made that canon. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, Way of the Cobalt Soul. We know that one. That was Bo. Bo. There's some abilities that Bo gets because she never got to that level. Um, the Moon Domain Cleric and the Blood Domain Cleric. I kind of want to just do the Blood Domain Cleric just because I don't know that one. Like, I don't All know right. the moon either, but blood seems interesting. We'll save the moon for the next time. That sounds fun. Hey, I saw that cat before. I'm in the Matrix. Whoa. Yeah, he's over there licking his butt. He's licking his foot, actually. He did, he is. Blood Domain Clerics, uh, developed in Wildmount, the Blood Domain Cleric centers around the understanding of the natural life force as it exists within the body and the divine conduit that it can become. Uh, gods who grant this power, and sort of goes into a bunch of like deity lists. Uh, here, uh, clerics of good gods use hemiocraft to fill their self to fill their self sacrifices with purpose and power, while clerics of fewer morals use blood oaths. Uh, blood of others to achieve their own mischievous ends. So it kind of feels like a little like Aztec culture where it's like, we're doing this to make sure the sun rises tomorrow. You know, I mean, we're not doing it to hurt you. We're just simply doing it to make sure this happens for everyone. Yeah. I guess that can be kind of... I was like, not everything's blood though. So I don't know if I would use that as an example. No, 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 but that that is a, a valid historical example. So, uh, I honestly can't think of any others right now. I mean, leeches. Ooh, that's a good, that's a good one. Get the demons and the sickness out of you. Yes. <laughs> Using leeches could definitely be considered a hemiocraft thing. Yeah. That's a good call. That's yes. the only one that I could think of that would be like they have on record as trying to be a medicinal thing. Like, oh, you know, this is what the doctors did then. I'm like, excuse me. That's a, it's a really good call. Um, they get domain spells. And you know this means spells that they just get to have access to. Yeah. Uh, false life. Sleep. Oh, false life? Isn't that like a warlock thing? It kind of is. It's not that good. It doesn't stack stack well. You can no, spend a... Landa uses it all the damn time. Well, that's because she's a squishy warlock. <laughs> it's good uh, initially. I guarantee she's going to stop using it in, uh, eventually. Every spell level above one, it does five HP temporary hit points. Okay. <laughs> Not that good. Sleep. Oh. Uh, hold person. Rave enfeeblement. I feel like that makes sense. For like blood, like controlling someone's blood, like... All right, you're no longer as strong. You know, making you, what is it when you have like less blood in your system, you get really dazed? Oh, you get lightheaded. Yeah, you get lightheaded. 
But yeah. I mean, you can have an iron deficiency too. Or you can do full bloodbender and do hold person. <laughs> And just sort of stop someone puppeting with the blood inside of them. I was surprised Nick didn't know what that was. I was like, yeah, if you ever watched like The Last Airbender, like... Later, Brain Tech. <laughs> There's some shit. <laughs> Haste and Slow. Those are some pretty powerful spells. Yeah, those are normally wizard spells. Huh? Those are really good. Yeah, those are generally wizard spells. Clerics don't get access to that. Yeah, we get access to sleep and whole person and stuff. I don't know if clerics do get access to sleep. Yeah. You have access to sleep? I think I do. It's either sleep or silence I'm thinking of. I don't even think you get access to silence. Yeah, I get access. Well, I have, hold on, let me look. Here, I got it, I got it. I know I have one of them. So, I believe silence is a second level spell. You do have silence, yes. Yeah, I think I have silence and not sleep. And sleep is, uh, is not a, a cleric spell. Anyways, uh, blight and stone skin Blight's pretty good. And then dominate person and hold monster. I have hold monster and what was the other one? The dominate person. No, the two you said before that. Oh, blight and stone skin. I have blight. Stone skin's from the druid. Yeah, it's like a druid uh, wizard thing. Because I have that as Kara. So it sounds like the spells that they get. Um, definitely fit in, in in flavor of like controlling someone's body and making them do something or making them weaker that you can kind of flavorfully say because they're losing blood or you're just manipulating their blood or you're just thinning them out because you don't necessarily have to have a hole in your body because you could just like drain blood from your heart and it would slow down oh because like all this is flowing so like if you stop circulation to a thing or an artery then you get some problems i feel like we just found your next subclass <laughs> you know what i mean that's like if she was really fucked up i, I mean not I like i mean you could play it not fucked up but i feel like yeah. it'd be more fun to play a fucked up not, person with this not for vera but i'm saying you as a person i think yeah. we found your next subclass because mm, i don't know We'll see. That's true. I know. You're playing a cleric right now. Always like to switch it up. At least I do. Um, bonus proficiencies. Uh, at first level, you gain proficiency with martial weapons. That's pretty good. You can fight with a longsword. Uh, Bloodletting focus. Starting at first level, your divine magic draws the blood f uh, from a magically infected wound that you have, uh, <laughs> worsening the agony of your foes. When you cast a damaging spell at first level or higher, uh, let's see here, whose du uh, duration is instantaneous, any creature within uh, with blood that takes damage from the spell takes an extra necrotic damage equal to two plus the spell's level. Hmm. So your damage spells do more on those who bleed. That's pretty good. I feel like you would have to work out with your DM what's considered blood because not everybody like bleeds red. I mean, they bleed things or like ooze and stuff. So it's like, do you count that? Like it's technically their blood, but it's not like you or I's blood. I would definitely like <laughs> not count oozes. Well, no, cause like I'm like, going back to Nick's example. Like he said, like he's bleeding, but it doesn't look like blood. He said it looked like smoke. Oh yeah, right, so, right, right. Like, like he said blood. it was bleeding, but it's not like what you and I would know as blood. That's up to the DM. Yeah. Yeah. Channel Divinity. Crimson Bond. Mm. You can choose you can use your channel divinity to form a supernatural bond with a creature that you can see, or with a creature from which you possess a blood sample of. This is Cree. <laughs> uh, the bond lasts for one hour or until your concentration is broken as you were concentrating on the spell. While the bond is in effect, you can use an action to learn the target's approximately distance and direction from you, as well as its current hit points and any conditions affecting it, uh, as long as the target is within 10 miles of you. Alternatively, you can use the action, your action to attempt to connect with the target's senses. You take 2d6 damage, and the target makes a con save. On a success, the bond fails. On a failure, Let's see here. Uh, you can choose to either enter, to either see or hear through the target's senses for a number of minutes equal to your wisdom modifier. 
It's almost like you're forcing yourself to make someone your familiar. That's an, that's crazy. Um, oh, imagine you're attracting a whole lot of friends doing this shit. Yeah. It also says here that it doesn't have to be a friendly creature. You can bond with someone and them not even know it and then choose to activate this and see through an enemy's thing, their eyes. It's like, let me go bond with that Tarasque. I'll be right back. No! <laughs> um, you actually get a second Channel Divinity. Hmm. Um, Channel Divinity, you usually just get two. Uh, destroy undead or, or turn undead and special one. Yeah. This has two special ones. Blood puppet. <laughs> well, that's self-explanatory. That is like last year, but... Oh, I'm sorry. This here comes at six level. Bond with something and then release it back to its boss. You can you know, like dom dominate person, go, go back to your boss. And as they're walking, you can shift into their eyes. And you can go, okay, they said this, they did that, they walked through this wall, perfect. Good thinking. At sixth level, you can use your channel divinity to briefly control a creature's actions. Whenever a creature is living or dead, what? As an action, <laughs> you can target a large or smaller creature or a corpse within 60 feet of you that has blood. A creature uh, you target must succeed a wisdom saving throw against your DC or be charmed by you. An unconscious creature automatically fails. But not a dead one. A corpse uh, targeted by this effect gains a semblance of life that you control. No save needed. Oh, okay. I was gonna say, it doesn't make sense for an unconscious body not to make the save, but a dead one has to make the save. Uh, Undead the... I would get, but not dead. Yeah, that's 100% true. Uh, on the affected creature or animated corpse, uh, corpse's turn, you can command it, no action is required, to move it half its speed and use an action to do one of the following. Interact with an object. Make a single attack. Do nothing. Uh, mm. Let's see here. An affected living creature must make a new saving throw at the end of each of its turn. If it succeeds, it ends the effect. Uh, if it is a corpse, it lasts for, a, I believe, a minute. Yes. Oh, jeez. At 17th level, you can use this feature to target a huge creature or smaller. Huge, I believe we confirmed as 4x4, four four, right? I thought they were bigger. Oh, like on a map, yeah. yeah. It's like a dragon. Or a giant. It's a big boy. You can command a giant to make a single or fuck you attack on their friends. You can raise a dragon. You can raise a dragon. For a minute. I mean, a minute is 10 rounds if you're in combat. You're like, wait, 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 don't dispose that, don't dispose that corpse yet. I'm gonna use it tomorrow. <laughs> Not yet. I, I need that one. <laughs> I know it's, I know it's, no, I think a Tarasque is like a five by five. I think it's called, Tarasque is considered gigantic or yeah. gargantuan. I think they're considered gargantuan. But like a red dragon is considered like a, an adult or ancient red dragon is considered gargantuan. But God, like an, an adult red dragon who is considered huge. Don't kill it yet. Don't. No, I know. I gotta keep, keep it moist. Keep it moist. <laughs> yeah. Um. At in addition to all that, at sixth level, you get uh, a thing called a uh, sanguine recall. Recall. What? My brain just farted. S A N G U I N E. Sanguine. Sanguine. Or recall. Sanguine. Sanguine. I have to look at the word. Oh, Tarasca is considered colossal. That's bigger than Gargantuan. That's funny. Yeah, there's no... Uh, it's like 7x7. Seven seven. Maybe like a baby Tarasca you could do that <laughs> You can sacrifice a portion of your own vitality to recover expended spell slots as an action. What? The spell slots, uh, spell, spell slots have to, uh, are, ha uh, can have a combined level equivalent or use half of your cleric level rounded up. None of the slots must be 6 level or higher. You take 1d8 necrotic damage for each spell slot recovered. Hmm. I mean, you can get your 5th level, so that's pretty good. <laughs> huh. 
you like he gives an example here you can recover one fourth level slot and take 4d8 damage oh that's a lot or you can recover four first level slots and take 4d8 damage that's the example so every spell slot you take back you get 1d8 mm. that could be clutch yeah uh if you're like i need to teleport or something where to recall is a fifth level spell i think it's sixth oh shoot well it says it can't be eighth level oh hold on i think it said it can't be sixth it says here none of the slots can be sixth level or higher yeah. where to recall is not fifth i'm sure there's a spell though that you can use at a clutch time <laughs> so that's a clutch move like we gotta go ah! <gasps> Let's go! <laughs> I mean, if you're part druid, maybe. Next round, because I it took an action to do this. That's intense. Um, the last ability you get is called Vascular Corruption Aura. <laughs> At 17th level, you can use your action to emit a deathly aura of necrotic energy that causes the veins of nearby foes to burst and bleed. And that's what I figured. For one minute, jeez, for one minute, any you hostile <laughs> for any hostile creature with blood that moves within 30 feet of you for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there takes 3d6 necrotic damage if a hostile creature with blood regains hit points while then in that area it only regains half well just don't piss off like a blood cleric when they get up there because they could just explode your ass and be like fuck you stop talking to me <laughs> i'm gonna look something up real quick so it lasts for a minute 10 right. rounds of your initiative 10 rounds so that means every what six seconds Hold on, Greater Six times ten. Is that thirty d six damage? That's a lot. Out of ten rounds, because it's every round, and you affect every creature within ten feet or uh, thirty feet. So it could be more technically spread out. No, you just don't fuck with them. <laughs> Blood clerics, man. Don't get on their bad side. Jeez. Blood domain clerics. Uh, I definitely like the Blood Domain Cleric. I feel that they are uh, nasty uh, <laughs> puppeteers and tricksters. You know, and they definitely have the versatility of of if they have to get out, they can get out. If they want to spy, they can spy. If they want to hurt you badly, they can hurt you badly. Um, yeah. They get at 8th level, I skipped it because it didn't matter, but I feel like it doesn't matter now. They get Divine Strike as opposed to uh, the Divine Magic thing, because, you know, clerics work opposite. Mm -hmm. Some are hitting you, some are, some are casting spells. This definitely is up in front. This Blood Cleric bear, you know, has to wear full-on plate armor. They get to use martial weapons. Coming at you with a great axe making you bleed and making you bleed even faster because they have crimson bond or bloodletting focus and because they're close to you they do the vascular thing and you're getting even more damage i kind of like this class i'm excited to see what the moon is next time next time all right uh Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Hopefully you uh, got to learn a little more about what Matt Mercer, Hannah Rose, and James Hector made. Or Heck. Hacker. Whatever. Uh, I'm just saying, thank you for the for the bookmark. That is, <laughs> that is just the best part of Not this. Not all the subclasses are nicely written text, but the bookmark. Dual class Blood Cleric and Necromancer. Well, next week we're going to cover the blood magic subclass of wizard, so maybe those two will be very interlocked. I definitely can see some benefits coming from the necromancer, but we'll see what the uh, blood wizard does next week. So until then, join us tomorrow at 2pm Pacific Standard Time for Magic at Mosted. We're going to be episode 50! Yeah. Ooh, milestone! <laughs> oh my god! Uh, that's crazy. And, um, 
We'll also uh, start, uh, if you haven't checked already, we have a bunch of highlights on our YouTube channel and social media channels. Uh, and you can always check us out on YouTube for uh, short, short rest. rest. Yes, we've already had two episodes of Short Rest go out uh, where we sort of dive into kind of what the players are thinking after they just finished a session. So kind of interesting. So uh, number 49 has already came out, so you can go watch that now. But until then, see you guys tomorrow. Bye.